door open in case other people want to come in. But uh, I wanted to give a little bit of an outline of what I was thinking of looking at, um, and then do a little bit of a round of introductions and um, what you're thinking of maybe getting out of this or wanting to look at. Um, so I'll just say a little bit about myself. Um, my name is Michelle, and I just moved to Worcester in August um, from Berlin, Germany. Uh, and I'm a first year PhD in the, in the, at Clark in Geography. And so uh, one of the questions that really interests me is the, is the relationship between participatory democracy and the commons. Um, and I did some work on this uh, in a master's thesis that I wrote in in Germany um, that had to do with the organization of the, uh, water. So I'm going to use some examples from that. Um, and I'll go more into that in a second, but it's kind of a relationship between co-ops, um, commons, and participatory democracy, and then what we can make out of that uh, kind of strange mix of things. Um, and then at the end, I definitely want to come back and ask about Worcester. Uh, and so how I was thinking of organizing it, I do have a presentation that has a bit of content in it. Uh, I hope it's not more than 20 minutes or so. Um, and then uh, doing maybe a couple of groups as to how that could apply to Worcester and then coming back and sharing those experiences and stuff like that. So maybe that's my plan. Can we do a round of names and maybe experiences with any of these issues and things you'd be interested in discussing or possible changes that you have come to any of that? Uh, yeah, sure. I'm Jordan and I'm a student at Clark also. Um, and um, uh, I guess, I mean, the thing that I'm really kind of interested in knowing is like, uh, like how people um, know what they know, kind of, and like, so, you know, how to inter like integrate knowledge that's like what people actually understand into like, you know, uh, policies and things that actually affect their lives. So, I'm interested in that. that is being um, evoked, if not used, um, a lot to create some political thinking around solidarity economy and create a solidarity economy movement um, in Europe, certainly in Italy, so um, I can see some connections there. Um, yeah, I'm Nicole, and I don't have a ton um, of experience, but I do have some. I think my, um, I have done a lot with community media, so understanding like the commons as it relates to creative content that people could reuse for different purposes, I have a bit of experience with that. And then also how tools like community TV stations, radio stations, and the internet can be used to help people tell their own stories and connect with one another in meaningful ways. And some of that's been in Worcester. And also just like around housing and things like that too. Um, I'm James, I'm a teacher in Worcester Beach Middle School. I'm at the edge of a few different organizations like on Soup and HX and Starship X. Um, and I'm just, as I get more comfortable with my youth and helping them organize to do things in school and in the area, it seems that this idea of the commons as just like a shared place and a shared ground and shared, um, shared resources and facilities is, is one of the most important things, so I'm really interested in perspective on that and how that relates like to and can extend on like the co-op idea without as much maybe investment from like people who need to go in and out because of one situation or another. Um, the prompt was something about the comments. Um, just any, any experience or thoughts you've had with co-ops, commons, or participatory democracy and any things you want to get or 
change about the structure, get from to change about the structure. Okay. Uh, my name is Michaela. Um, I would have a an affiliation specifically with co-ops. I volunteer with Green Worker Cooperatives, which is a co-op incubator in Vermont. Um, I'm really interested in this because I think that there are a lot of limits to co-ops, which is basically who is it, who is it a member, and what does membership mean, and how are um, how does how is participation affected by that? Because you can be a member of very little um, participation. So I'm really interested in um, maybe a little less structured areas that have really easy access with open membership. So. This is Luke. She makes sleeping noises. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm Steve. Um, I've been working with, uh, worked with the Artichoke Food Co-op for a while, and now I've been working with Worcester Roots, and that's a kind of uh, umbrella kind of uh, co-op incubation group here in Worcester. And um, recently I've been doing the Co-op Academy, preparing a lot of new co-ops. Um, so I'm interested in co-ops. Um, I'm also interested in just this creation of solidarity economy. You know, when I a while ago when I was an activist stuff in Worcester, it was um, Wogan, Worcester Global Action Network, and it was all anti-capitalism, anti anti-globalization at that time. And I don't know, recently things have just really shifted more toward just creating in the solidarity economy. So it's much more positive, creative kind of stuff, which is cool. And I also see this stuff about like, okay, well, who's in it, who's out, what does membership mean, and how do we increase participation in that context? So those are all Sean, most of my experience with co-ops has just been in housing, um, where I'm living now, where I was living in Philadelphia, and kind of what I'm hoping to get is just to better understand Worcester, better understand what's available, and uh, I'm also a social worker, and so I'm interested in seeing like what I can provide to my clients, and what kind of community settings uh, would be available and helpful on the more macro level. I'm Jane Spencer, and... Um, a lot of a lot of emerging cooperative, maybe not, not necessarily co-op, but cooperative efforts in my neighborhood for localizing economy and, and collaborations. And I also want to mention I spent a summer in Kreuzberg before the wall came down, which was real interesting. Kreuzberg, Berlin, which was awesome. Lots of squatting, you know, yeah. and Ufa fabric, you know, and all these kind of cool things. Nice. Yeah, I was living there for a while. <laughs> so, though after the wall fell, so it was a bit different. Um, so, yeah, I'm just going to preface this a little bit by saying exactly these type of questions were interesting. Me coming from Berlin and, and a question around organization or how should we think about changing the energy system there. So there was a lot of um, work around this in the last couple of years. And there was one group that was um, trying to do, well, did actually uh, go through with starting a referendum initiative that would, the goal was to remunicipalize the grid, the electricity grid infrastructure, but at the same time, more over that, to create a um, Berlin-owned uh, public utility that was uh, socially and environmentally um, kind of organized and had direct democratic control, a couple different mechanisms of direct democratic control. And something that was uh, also tried at about the same time was a co-op that would just be an electricity co-op um, that could do, that also wanted to buy the grid. Um, and basically maybe produce as well. And they were kind of competing at some points and um, kind of together at some points, um, but I really created this this question of how can you create can you create really the most participation and the most um, equal system for everyone um, is a co-op model where you have to have a minimum of 500 euro to pay into it something that's possible for everyone. Um, Whereas, obviously, if you do it with the state, there are a whole bunch of problems that come in with that of traditional bureaucratic and technocratic uh, models of the state, uh, repression, uh, capitalist development, um, neoliberalism, 
types of things like that. So uh, both are contradictory, but um, the group that I was working with was more interested in trying to uh, think about the state as possibly more porous than some other people think of it and trying to change ideas of what the political is going from below. So that's also, the, these are the questions that I'm interested in. And um, so you have basically, you have a co-op that's something that's group organized and group owned. And it's, um, it's great, it's based on solidarity and not for profit. Um, but it has maybe some of these limits that I've just said. Uh, and in the, in the discourse on this, there's a lot of, of times where you think of the co-op as similar to the commons. So um, generally, the commons are also thought of as group self-organized and owned, not um, public, and not private ownership. But let's um, go into this a little bit. Uh, yeah, so basically what I basically just said, uh, having to invest to be able to participate in, in a co-op is a limit. Uh, and maybe not being the best, uh, the best model for services that need to be universal, such as water, education, energy, housing, healthcare, things like this, um, especially perhaps at a global level, uh, where you know people in the global south might have less money to directly invest in services. Uh, there are, however, lots of other examples. There are basically almost all of Costa Rica's water is organized in co-ops. Um, you can have you can have co-op models that are different. So I'm not saying it's not the only that that's a, a one-dimensional thing. So commons, exactly you've said, uh, Christina, that they're evoked a lot but not necessarily used. Uh, it's true. Um, but first I'm going to go into a little bit. So when you're thinking of the state as a commons, some of the problems that are about this is basically the whole neoliberalization of the state that's happened um, since the 70s, longer periods, uh, and a, a wave of things, especially in the 90s, of uh, privatization of basic services and thinking of, of basically public services as commodities and not citizenship models but consumer models. Uh, and so there's been some, in these discussions about public services, there's been a discourse that's opened up kind of recently, since about 2000, about other models with alternatives to privatization. It's you can have the state that's not based on, you can have, yeah, not privatization or corporatization or public-private partnerships, all of these ways that are basically introducing private methods of governing the public, even if it's not completely privatized. Um, so not that, but also not social engineering, uh, traditional top-down bureaucratic hierarchi uh, hierarchical methods of state governance and services, which rightly have been criticized and do have some problems with them. Um, so uh, this has been seen in a lot of different ways. A lot of it has been seen there's a lot of work on this in the UK, trying to get labor unions uh, more involved and users more involved, use everyone's knowledge, uh, communicating more, um, and using service providers uh, and users together to reform the services and workers as well. Um, issues of co-production, other things like that that I'll get into a little bit more as we go on. So commons, exactly. Uh, this nebulous thing. Uh, it is basically it's generally defined as something that is not private ownership but not um, public ownership either. It's communal ownership, but the problem with that, it's a focus on ownership, and um, I think that that, uh, what, a main point of what I want to get across here is ownership is not the same thing as organization, and the two things do not have to be tied together. Um, and I think the thing that's most uh, important about the commons is the social practice of commoning. So I'm going to get into a bit more of this, but um, having group decisions about priorities and creating regimes that, um, that kind of manage a system is the main thing that I think is uh, important about commons. It's not, um, it's not completely uh, uncontroversial in this definition. 
but basically, yeah. So yeah, okay. Um, so basically, that's that is partially parallel to some design criteria that Elena Arström developed, who's the most well-known person working in the Commons. Uh, she won a Nobel Prize for economics. She's actually a political science uh, person, but really brought out these ways of social organization. How can we think about them? They're along these lines, which are pretty jargony. Um, basically, you have a system that you can, you can see and you can monitor, and there are various ways of, of organizing conflicts. Um, and one of the most important ones is number seven. Uh, you, the system itself has autonomy. So you won't have either a market uh, organizer coming in and trying to buy your system or a state uh, trying to say this is how you have to run it. Um, so what this basically means is you have participatory or collaborative organization. And I think the most important ones are finding shared gold and establishing trust, finding ways to communicate, um, and finding systems of decision making, monitoring, and conflict resolutions that are based in real participation and power sharing. Um, that's a big one. Uh, actually, a lot of times you have some types of systems that have participation, but they're not based on actual power um, to follow through on those decisions or things like this. A lot of the discourse that the World Bank and other institutions have been using on participation is, is things that's like basically consultancy will ask you what you want to do with this particular thing, but then they actually don't have any effect on anything. And so that's a problem with methods of uh, some, some types of participation um, that are sometimes used. It's a real kind of big word in development uh, things at the moment, and they say we're, we're using participatory methods and things like that, but it's a question of whether these people actually have power to decide anything, and that's also basically the question of whether um, people have really an incentive to join that system, because if they don't know that they will have power to turn something over, they also won't engage in the system. Um, system autonomy, like I said before, uh, plus uh, what I think is interesting is a lot of what the more uh, critical and anti-capitalist uh, literature in the common says is a, an addition not only of these types of organizing um, and the institutional criteria, but also a qualitative dimension saying it has to be about a certain, creating a, a relationship between some type of group of people or a community, a resource, and the commons regime itself. So it's trying to change, um, basically, separating the subject and object relationship and creating kind of one thing that's more, more cohesive and that values the resource and the community over a longer period of time. So basically you have this question that I ask myself, um, can state property also be a commons? Um, if you use these type of, of decision-making uh, uh, practices and you have a system where you can actually share power and have autonomy over some of the things you're deciding, um, what happens? Uh, so basically, a couple of the, the reasons why it might be possible to think of that is because there hasn't been any historical um, hard line between what's defined as the commons, what's defined as public or state ownership, and what's defined as private property. It's been humongously uh, fluid throughout history, uh, and it's a lot based on who has power and things like this. Uh, and the other part is that you have commons, I think, basically uh, defined by their social form and not their ownership category. Um, so, but to do this, you would have to change the character of public ownership from what we currently understand it and reframe this common state antagonism that is generally brought about um, when you think about it. So, uh, in my master's thesis, I developed this idea of commons-based organization as a way to think about this. It's also not something that I think a lot of people are using. It's just something I'm 
proposing and putting out there, it may or may not be valid or useful, but it's just what I'm proposing. Um.